a future programmer, just arrived about a month ago. His name is Neumann, if anybody can get the name after von Neumann. Um, the relevance might come in a little bit later. Okay, so the title is um, in deference to a great person of the analog electronics world called Bob Pease. If anybody's done analog electronics, he was a fantastic inventor of anal in analog electronics. He did fantastic articles and uh, talks. And it was always, so what's all this something about anyway? So what's all this blockchain stuff about anyway? Who has, who knows anything about blockchain? Who knows a fair amount about blockchain? OK, so I think it's probably just pitched on about the right level then. Um, so I'll t tell you something about basically where I'm coming from here. I'm working for a company called Hello Gold, which allows, basically, we're in Malaysia we're, uh, because the Malaysian currency is crap. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I noticed all the Malaysians here say yes, right? Um, and so basically what we're trying to do is let them ha um, have investment. Is it coming up? No, it's not. It's just making it. Oh, my God. Sorry about that. <laughs> 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 okay. uh, basically, we're, we're allowing them to, in, in, to invest in investment-grade gold to put part of their savings there as a stable investment. And we're putting, and basically, we're building. We're now we've done our, our prototypes, and we've got a product out there. We're migrating that onto the blockchain, and you'll learn a little bit about what the blockchain is all about. Right. So, my personal philosophy: you may not know anything about blockchain now, but Within five years, you bloody well better do, right? Um, in the 1970s, which I do remember, um, there was this big thing came out called DBase2, right? The first, like really the first accessible personal database, and everybody was using it. You, you know, car spare shop, can I build you a database for your for your parts so you don't have to use the catalog? Everybody was building databases, right? Um, and that's sort of like the stage that blockchain is in. People are building blockchain things at the moment. But now, you don't build databases. You're building an e-commerce platform. Well, we need a database for that, and we need this, and we need that. We need a mobile app. It's just one of the tools. Blockchain is going there. So you will have to learn something about it. Uh, so here's your start. So what is a blockchain? What's special about Ethereum? Um, how do you program a smart contract? And most important, of course, how do you talk to it from Go? So what is a blockchain? It's a load of signed transactions which are put into signed blocks, which are added to a chain, which is basically a linked list, but on hard drive. Um, on thousands of computers worldwide in such a manner that all of those computers which do not trust each other can come to some kind of a consensus to all agree on the nature of on, on basically what is in that linked list right um, right so transactions what's a transaction basically is anything that can change the state of something you know what a transaction is right it's like a rest call so um, I, I make a rest call and I say okay transfer some money from me to Sao Xiong 40, 42 magic coins right right you're doing all right right they're going up in price <laughs> okay so we're, we're all used to accounting transactions, and you put them together into a ledger, and the sum of all those transactions gives you the current state of your company accounts or your personal account, right? You know, because you get your bank statement, and you see all these individual transactions, and you can actually add them all up, and at the bottom you found out, found out how much in debt you are at the end of the month. Yeah, right, <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so in deference, John von Neumann, the other one, made this great statement, young man in mathematics, you don't understand things, you just get used to them. So I'm going to take that because 
what is a digital signature? Right? Now, I must assume that everybody in this, un in this room understands hashing. Right? You know what a hash is, right? A hash is something where if you make a, a microscopic change to your data, you make a huge change to the value, to the hash value, right? So I have taken that, um, that statement. I just changed the full, first full stop to a comma. And what the hell? I, I hate that one. I hate that on the Mac. I really do. So basically, you get two dramatically different, different numbers, right? Yeah, there you go. That's my Go code for today. <laughs> right? So there we go. But then what you're going to do next, if you can find out where the... Oh, bugger off. I should have closed Telegram, shouldn't I? Press mute. Pardon? Mute. Just press mute. That's a very good idea. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm obviously way too, way too highly trained here. Right. OK, so now, so basically, the way you get a digital signature is you take the hash value and you encrypt it using public key encryption, right? Which I'm, sh I'm sure most of you know about. But basically, you create a random key, which is your private key. From that, using elliptic curve, whatever's, you can generate a public key. And it's a one-way thing. You can't get to the private key from the public key, but you can get to the private <laughs> Right? So basically, it works like that. If I encrypt something with my private key, and you've got my public key, you can, number one, unencrypt it, and number two, know that it's me that encrypted it. Right? That's simple. Right, so we take our transaction, we get the hash of it, we encrypt that, and the encryption of that becomes the signature so basically, we just add that signature to the end of the thing. And now, nobody can change this because they don't have my private key, so they cannot forge this transaction. Right? And so the same thing, we'll put them in, we put a whole load of these transactions into a block, and we do the same thing again. We get the hash, we, we encrypt it. That becomes the digital signature of the block. And the block refers to the previous block, as in all linked lists. Right? And then we, basically, there's some kind of a competition out there. See who can come up with the first block. And, the, and there's like these artificial competitions to make it difficult so that somebody's going to come up with it first. And it's not always going to be the same person. Right? So basically, all of the nodes on the network will agree that this is the current state of the blockchain. This is the current right, of all the blocks, of all the transactions. Right? And because it's difficult to actually do these transactions, it becomes even harder for anybody to modify it. Because everybody else agrees this is the current state. So you can't go back and change the past. Right? So this is, you know, what blockchain is all about. And you know, the first things, like Bitcoin, was basically all about transfer of value. The mathematics and the cryptography ensured there was only a slow release of this currency, which was done by the people who had, you, you know, you put, you're the person who puts the, creates the next block. You get a reward for it, right? And so, but. It, the, the, the release of those is slow, so there's scarcity, so it can be used as an asset. Right? So that's Bitcoin, that's a thousand other alt altcoins created with mathematics. So what is Ethereum doing diff differently? Um, well, basically, Ethereum is not just an accounting machine, right? Bitcoin is basically an accounting machine, right? Ethereum, however, a transaction doesn't have to just transfer value, right? Now, I know we are all dedicated Go programmers. Anybody here um, want to actually admit Shh, you've done PHP or something like that? <laughs> right? I mean, if you've done PHP, you know that you could, on a PHP server, upload a PHP script and have the server put it into the PHP directory 
thereby extending the capabilities of the server by one more function, right? Yeah? Well, Ethereum's like that. You can also post a contract. What's a contract? A contract is something that's been compiled down into a byte code because the nodes in the Ethereum blockchain are not just accounting machines. They also have an, uh, a virtual machine. Right? So if you, know, you can post a contract onto the blockchain, and you can also send a transaction. So transactions can now do one of two things. It can either just send value, so you still get your 42 coins, or my transaction can go not from me to somebody else's account, but from me to a contract. So I could call a method on a contract, right? Which is that PHP analogy. I've uploaded the script, and now I call the script, OK? Okay, um, so yeah, 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 yeah. Have I covered all of that? Yeah, pretty much. So yeah, it's, it's so like post, you know, posting a contract's a bit like code injection, really, but it's good code injection, right? Um, so what's a contract in bytecode? You call it a bit like doing an RPC call. Uh, it's, you know, so you're do, doing that transaction. So it's got a contract has instance data which is basically, you bring up a new node and it works its way through the blockchain, it knows the instance data by the sum of all the transactions that talk to the contract. Right, that's how it's maintained, that's how, and of course, all of, the, all of the nodes execute exactly the same thing, so they all come to the same conclusion. Um, it has methods with parameters, local data, constructors, it can, so Ethereum has got a currency called ETH, right, or Ether. Um, so the contract can hold value. Um, every node executes the same code. Um, so yeah, each node understands exactly the same state of that contract, right? You can do two things with a contract, right? You can, if you want to, alter the state of that contract, right? So, you know, in the case of Hello Gold, someone wants to buy gold, which means that we'd use the gold price, we would reduce their cash balance, we'd increase their gold balance. They're going to change the state of the contract, right? So we would send a transaction. That's the top one, yeah, right? So it actually costs a little bit of ether to do that, and one of the reasons it costs is because um, basically you use up the ether a little bit per instruction. And this makes sure that, uh, you know, basically the more, you know, the, um, you, you can't put contracts out there with code that goes on forever. You know, you'll eventually run out of the transaction fee, which they call gas, right? So. It, yeah, you know, otherwise you could you could hang the entire the entire network, which would be stupid, right? But um, and if you run out of gas, or if it fails for any other reason, then all changes are rolled back, right? So the other thing you can do is if you just want to query it, it doesn't cost anything, because if you just want to query it, the the node you are talking to has got exactly the same data as everybody else. You, know, you could be performing huge transactions, huge calculations now, right? But you're not going to change the state, so it doesn't have to be propagated. So that's done on a local machine, and you can get values back from that, right? You don't get values back from making a transaction, because if you make a transaction, it's got to be agreed amongst all the nodes first, and it, would, it may take some time. The only way you can get it back is once it's gone onto the blockchain, uh, you can post, a, post log data with it and you can inspect that log data. Or you can see the changes it's made. Right. Um, so I'm going to make up a totally arbitrary problem. And he's looking at his phone here, right? <laughs> right? So I'm going to assume that we're going to have smart meters. 
<laughs> Yay. Okay, we've got smart meters, and you've got a power company, a totally nameless power company, right? <laughs> um, you know, and basically, you're going you're gonna to be... All, so, like, your meter is going to send... the you know, At regular intervals, it sends out how much power you're, you've consumed to the power company, or rather to the smart contract. And you can pay by going to a teller and giving them some money, and that, that, that can then pay off your bill, right? Now, I've got no idea who could possibly want anything like this, Salshon. No idea at all, right? Um, so, you're going to build a contract. The there are two main languages. Well, there are three. Four if you include um, the assembler, which is like a stack machine. But the, uh, the main languages are Solidity, which is a JavaScript-like language. There is Serpent, or its new, new replacement called Viper, which are Python-like. Um, and there's LLL, which is low-level language. Most people do Solidity, right? OK, so it should look incredibly familiar. It's like an object, so contract. Power token, storage declaration, methods and constructors, boom. Um, I'm creating a data structure with um, the meter ID, right? So the meter uses its own Ethereum address. Um, I've got one value for the balance and one, val one value for the last reading, right? The idea is the balance is the amount of unpaid electricity, right? And then I record the last reading so that when I get a new reading, something like that. I think I, I had it sort of figured out. We'll get there in a minute, right? And of course, we have the cost of power. Right. So the constructor, basically, there are um, three, three actors in this. There's the owner, the people who posted the contract, who one has to assume may, from time to time, adjust the cost of electricity which I haven't built into this. Uh, you've got the tech guy who installs the meter. You have got the, um, the teller who you, who you pay money to, right? And all this does is the constructor just sets those values. And the contract should have been called power, not power token. I'll get it right before I post it. Right. So what have we got? So the, the tech guy comes along and what he does is he sets your balance to zero because he's putting in a new meter, right? Um, he, he sets the meter ID. Um, what the hell was stuck? Oh, and he sets the last reading to whatever the current reading on the meter is, right? Because it may not be a new meter. If you put in a second-hand meter, he puts in the current value. So that next time it posts a value, it can, it can do the difference. I thought I, I, thought I muted that. <laughs> It says mute. Maybe it was Oh, shit. You know, I, it's coming through the HDMI, isn't it? <laughs> OK, so basically, you can check the balance. Now, balance of is, gonna, is a call, right? It's a constant, so you don't have to pay to check the balance. And all it does is it tells you your current balance times the cost of electricity is how much money you owe. And it's got pay bill, so when you go and pay your bill, you've got, basically, it will subtract from, from your balance however much you're going to pay divided by the cost of electricity. I didn't do any checks to make sure you can't overpay. Right, there are ways to do this, but I'm not going to bother now. Uh, now, basically, on the first one and the third one, I've got like must be tech at the top and must be teller at the bottom. Now, this is a bit weird, right? These things are called modifiers. Uh, Sao Shong did actually put, yeah, I mean, like, my talks are usually very, very serious, right? Uh, Sao Shong doesn't know this because I, my Facebook has got a load of jokes. So he, he actually thought I would put jokes in my, in my talk. Sorry, Sao Shong. No jokes in my talk, right? Um, so what's must be teller? <laughs> no. There we go. See, yeah, well, every time I try a joke, it falls flat. Right, OK. So that is basically a modifier. 
Um, so basically, if you call must be teller, it executes this piece of code. So it says, is the sender of the person the teller? Right? If it isn't, throw. If you throw a contract, it just dies, everything's rolled back. Otherwise, there's an underscore there, almost on the dotted line. Right? That, that means execute the rest, of, the rest of that piece of code. Right? So you'd have one of these for must be teller, one of these for must be tech. Right, that's m and basically you can have an I uh, I had an event. You can have an event. If you call this event, there's no code to it. All it does is it puts it in the log, and um, basically, you know, if, uh, if you've got a um, an Ethereum wallet, it, you can read the log. You can write code to read the log. In this case, I had this function purchase and it logged this data, which you can see over there, right? OK, um, what else did we have? OK, so basically, when the reading came in, uh, we had this function must be this modifier, must be my, read, my meter, which says that basically the sender has to be my meter, right? The meter has my, my ID and my, right? And basically, all it's going to say here is we, t we add to my balance the new balance, take away the last balance. That's the amount of electricity I've used. That's really all it does. Um, if it's gone negative, I would, put, I would call an error event to go into the log saying, somehow, this guy's got negative electricity usage. And then, of course, the men in blue arrive at the door. Right? Now. I know I sort of like whizzed through this, but I don't think that anybody in this room after a couple of days would find putting that together very difficult, right? Yeah, if you can write Go code, you can write this stuff, yeah? And you can put it onto the blockchain. You can, you can put it onto the blockchain from a wallet from the parity environment, whatever. Now, one of the interesting things is that um, Ethereum has got numerous clients, right? There's, the first one was written in C++, and I've looked at the code, and it's horrible. It has one written in Go, which is now basically the de facto one. It's called, it's called Geth. And I basically have said this to a few people already today. Uh, I've, I have looked at various crypto code bases written in C++, and they are a nightmare. When I looked at the source code for Geth, it is poetry in code, really. It's quite a big code base, but you can go into it. You can explore it. It is not hard to follow, right? And I have done years of, of coding in C++. So it's not that I'm you know, purely a Go aficionado, right? So um, when you want to do it, basically, if you clone Go Ethereum into your, into your Go path, you make it, it creates a program called ABI Gen. ABI Gen will then create a Go wrapper round the interface to the smart contract, right? Now that is lovely, so that basically when you deploy, deploy the contract, there's actually a function called, where is it? Deploy contract somewhere. Uh, yeah, deploy power. Oh, sorry, th yeah, this has actually been created in, in the, uh, as a result of ABI gen, and all you have to do is call deploy power, right? Um, but you load the key file. Um, okay, now when you when you you in order to do this, you have to be running an Ethereum node on your computer. But you got that when you when you when you downloaded and installed installed Go Ethereum, right? You run it. It creates an account which gives you a key file. You load that key file into here, and you 
bind it as a transactor using the, the password for your key file when you set up the account, right? And using that, you just got this very simple piece of code to deploy the contract. It is deployed, right? One second, is it? One minute. Oh, cool, I've got a whole minute. I can, I can do this. Um, right, so basically you can make calls and transactions, right? Notes will be up, the notes will be posted for you to see. Um, Etherscan is an amazing block explorer. It has been developed by a guy called Matthew Tan, who's in KL, and everybody. Anybody here used Ethereum? Anybody used Ethereum and not looked at Etherscan? No. Basically, 99.99% .99 of people who make even one transaction in Ethereum then check it on Etherscan, right? Um, you've got the record of transactions. So what have we achieved? We have got an immutable record system for this unnamed power company, right? Obviously not in Singapore, <laughs> right? With role, so it's immutable. You've got role-restricted activities. Nobody else can pay the bill apart from, can actually record the bill payment apart from the teller. Uh, you've got records that, that, that can't be forged. You've got publicly auditable data using an easily available infrastructure with minimal setup. So everybody in this room, I believe, probably within five years will be using either Ethereum or something that follows it as appropriate, just like you use databases as appropriate. Right. Um, so that is about it, um, except for the fact that, okay, um, I've noticed that like most people here um, have included somewhere in their talk a quote from a certain Australian gentleman, <laughs> right, um, who will be talking after me and he'll be doing totally quotes by that same Australian gentleman. So, Here's my quote from Dave Cheney. Um, he, this morning we were talking about what was probably the most obvious thing about my appearance today, and it's not the hat for a change, right? About this thing. And I said, yeah, you know, I was riding through Malaysia and I hit, I hit a dog and I came off. And he said, I was riding along and I hit a kangaroo. <laughs> right, thank you very much everybody. Any questions for Dave? Any questions? How do you manage identity for your users? Like, did you put the private key on the app itself, or do you manage it separately? So, um, basically, um, in, in this particular case, we'd have to figure out how to give them an account key. Uh, so if they wanted to check their own balances or we could manage it for them for, for checking. Uh, because in this case there are no actual role-based activities on behalf of a user other than checking their account. Right, so you don't, wouldn't actually even need to be using an Ethereum address for that person. Um, of course, if, if they're making activities happen, like say from a mobile phone, then you'd have to create a key pair on their mobile phone. Right, in which case you may need to build things what to happen if they totally lose their private key, like smashing their phone in a motorbike accident or something like that, you know. Right? Okay. We're done. No questions? All right. Well, sir. Enjoy. <laughs> All right, thank you for flying from Malaysia. Oh, yeah, yeah. I,